My name is John Orr. I'm a university lecturer in engineering at the University of Cambridge, and I'll be chairing this webinar. Before we hear from our speakers tonight, I just wanted to give a little bit of background of why this is such an important event. The launch of the Structural Carbon Tool is part of the institution's work to tackle climate emergency, which is a topic which has huge importance for buildings and construction. The graph that you see on the screen here shows global carbon dioxide emissions between 1970 and 2020. And now you see the pathway that the IPCC give us, which has a chance of reaching one and a half degrees warming. So all of us have been educated and have worked on this upslope of ever increasing carbon emissions. And now we have a huge pivot point. We must now be working on this downslope, which represents a massive change in how we approach design and construction. So we are collectively undertaking a massive leap towards net zero and hopefully a controlled leap. And a big part of this will be measuring and learning from each other's carbon data, which is why the launch of this tool is so important. So I feel that this is a huge opportunity for us as structural engineers to stretch our creativity and imagination to achieve the lowest carbon possible on every single project we work on. So this change is a positive one and an exciting one. So in the webinar today, we're going to hear from Will Arnold and Penny Gowler. Will will begin with an introduction and then Penny will move on to some of the development behind the tool and a demonstration of it before a summary from Will and then we'll move to Q&A. So let me introduce our two speakers for this evening. Will Arnold is Head of Climate Action at the iStruct team. He leads the institution's response to the climate emergency, bringing this action into all aspects of our work, including the publication of best practice guidance. Prior to his current role, he was a practicing structural engineer at Arup for over 10 years. He sits on the Structural Awards judging panel and is a member of the Engineering Advisory Group for the Structural Engineer. Penny Gowler is an Associate Director at Elliot Woods with over 15 years structural engineering experience and an interest in the sustainable refurbishment of existing buildings. As sustainability lead, Penny is instrumental in embedding embodied carbon analysis across Elliot Wood projects. She is passionate about low carbon design and circular economy principles and aims to drive structural engineering projects towards a lower carbon circular economy approach. And now I can pass over to Will for an introduction. Over to you, Will. Thank you, John. So, um, yeah, I'm Will. I'm Head of Climate Action at the Institution, as John said. And uh, basically, before I hand over to Penny, who's actually going to show you the tool that you've all given up your evenings to come and see, um, I wanted to take a few minutes to remind ourselves how this fits into the big picture. I think it's really easy to get lost in numbers and metrics, particularly with something like this, which is effectively a, a new form of accounting. So it's important to remind ourselves why this matters and what we're going to do with the output of our number crunching as we go forward and as we try and move along John's graph. Right. So, like I said, we're going to do a quick recap, 10 minutes max, and then Penny will get on with the good stuff and give you this tool that you've, um, you've given up your readings for. As this quote from the IPCC special report says, we are in need of rapid, far reaching and unprecedented change. Those are words that you've probably heard quite a lot over the last year in this pandemic, but this is something bigger. It's at the point where scientists, economists and even politicians now agree that climate change has the potential to make COVID look like a comparative walk in the park. This graph, which is very similar to John's graph, this graph shows humanity's carbon emissions over the last 60 years. Don't mistake what this graph shows. This is not cumulative. This is showing our emissions each year and it's been going up staggeringly fast. So in 1960, humanity was responsible for the release of 10 billion tonnes of carbon into the atmosphere in that year alone. Um, this is carbon dioxide only. Other varieties of greenhouse gas are also available. You need to add 10 or 20 percent to the graph to account for those as well. 1960, 10 billion tonnes. By 1990, we were up to releasing 20 billion tonnes each year, and we are now around about the 40 billion tonnes per year mark. You'll see that there are some important climate summits marked on this line. You'll also notice that they do very little to change the uphill climate that line. In fact, the total emissions since Rio 1992 add up to more than the total emissions in the entire history of humanity prior to 1992. So in other words, we've emitted more carbon whilst informed of the consequences than we ever managed to do in ignorance of them. That's not very good. But we also know what needs to happen next. So we need to more or less halve our emissions by 2030, and then we need to get to zero by 2050. 
The left hand side of this graph increases faster than it has ever increased in the history of this planet, but we need to go downhill far, far quicker. So if the left hand side is like a sports car accelerating off the start line, frankly, the right hand side can only be described as slamming on the brakes before we either go off a cliff or crash into a brick wall. We now have eight years, nine months and 14 days to halve our emissions. So unless you're planning to retire in that time, you might as well start getting used to doing carbon calculations, get excited about reducing it because it's not going to go away. In fact, before long, this will become your legal obligation if it, not already ha if it hasn't already. The countries marked in green on this map have net zero legislation that's either in place or is soon to be enacted. The orange countries have official government policy to the same effect. And the red countries are in formal discussions around taking those first steps. There are some obvious exceptions on this map, and you might even disagree with one or two of the colours, but this is only going to continue in one direction, which means that the countries that you work in either have net zero laws in place already, or they will be bringing these in over the coming years. Right, so that's what the science and the law tells us about what needs to happen. But why? Let's take one minute to touch on what will happen if we fail to cap global warming to one and a half degrees. Let's look at the difference between one and a half degrees and two degrees, because after all, that's pretty small, right? Wrong. At one and a half degrees, flood risk around the world doubles. Speaking to you as somebody whose house nearly flooded on Christmas Eve of last year, that scares me. At two degrees though, it practically triples. At one and a half degrees, nearly 700 million people, which is about the same as the population of Europe, will be exposed to extreme heat waves every 20 years. So that's three or four times in your lifetime, severe enough heat wave that people die as a result of it. At two degrees, it's two billion people. That's more than Europe, North America, South America, and Australasia put together. So one and a half degrees C is really, really important. If we don't meet this curve, then things are gonna get very uncomfortable by the end of this century. Now, um, I say the end of the century because that's the time frame used in various reports, such as the IPCC report. I think we forget how close the end of the century is. This is my nephew. This is young Bobby. Now, baby Bobby was born in 2019. That means that we are talking about things that will happen to this planet when Bobby is 80 years old. He'll probably be retired. He might be a grandfather. I'm sure that all of you know somebody like Bobby. I want you to picture that person for a second. I want you to imagine them at their 80th birthday party, maybe blowing out candles surrounded by family and friends. What kind of a world are we gonna have left for them? Every decision you make on every project you work on matters. And from now on, you're making those decisions in the knowledge of what will happen if we get this wrong. These are informed decisions, not ignorant ones. And your decisions are going to impact the lives of people that you know and people that you love. It's time to change what we do. Now, some good news, because that's all a bit heavy. Um, the good news in this is that as a structural engineer or a building designer or anyone who works in the built environment, you have the potential to do something really substantial about this problem that faces us. Globally, buildings and construction contributes to nearly 40% of energy related carbon emissions. And the next biggest piece on this chart is industry and infrastructure, which we also have a foot in. Structures, and by that I mean the emissions related to construction, transportation, and installation of structural materials. Structures makes up 10% of the total. So that 40 billion tons of carbon we discussed earlier, four billion of that is us. That's what we have to play with. That's what we have to reduce. Right, let's talk about another 10% for a second. I'm gonna let you into a little secret. That scary graph that we saw earlier, you know, the one that looked dramatic and unprecedented, just like we've been asked to do, that line is actually surprisingly easy for us to stay on. If we can reduce our emissions by 10% every year from now on, then we pass 50% in time of 2030, and we get to nearly zero by 2050. If every member of this institution can commit to doing 10% better this year than they did last year, then between us, we save 3 million tonnes of carbon this year alone. 
That is significant. That's on the scale of turning off the lights, in fact, turning off the power, lights, electricity, everything, for all of London for the entire year. That's how big an impact our collective action can have. Even if you focus your work on small projects, that work and your decisions contribute towards this impact. This needs all of us to do this together. Okay, right, last bit from me. Um, we've recapped what's happening to the world that's so scary. We've looked at how significant the role of the engineer is. Let's do one final minute on the changes we can make to our work to tackle this. And this is where this tool comes in. Clearly in a minute, I can't tell you all the things we need to change in our work, but we'll do something really high level to give ourselves some context. Um, so for, for those of you who follow me on LinkedIn, uh, you'll know that I had a bit of a dig at Bill Gates earlier in the week. Sorry, Bill. I did this because whilst I think that Bill's new book is great with its stories of technical innovations and new materials, it's not going to help us save 10% in 2021. If we want to save 10% this year, quite simply, we need to use 10% less stuff. Using less stuff means questioning the brief, which is in the top right-hand corner of this, uh, this page. It means offering alternatives to your client that have similar outcomes for less stuff. It means prioritizing reuse to avoid using new stuff. And then it means pushing on structural efficiency like you've never pushed on it before, because all of a sudden, people are quite welcoming of this and they're asking us to do it. Now, we can't you know, touch on this without saying that, of course, embodied carbon is part of a much bigger, far more complicated picture. Sustainability is big, it's intertwined, it's knotty. You've got carbon, biodiversity, education, equality. These things are all interrelated. We mustn't forget this bigger picture, but we must also remember that embodied carbon is where the structural engineer's biggest role is amongst all of this. And this is the reason why we've been working with Elliot Wood to give away these tools for free. We want you to make that impact where it counts the most. We need you to use these tools at the earliest stages of design to help you make informed decisions and set things off in the right direction. These are not tools that are there just to help you calculate carbon. In fact, at concepts and scheme stage, you can't do this at all that accurately anyway. But with some rough data, you can work out where the carbon's hiding, and you might even be able to decide that option B is maybe, I don't know, 50% better than option A, in which case you might say, yeah, let's pursue option B. This allows you to target your material reduction conversations. It helps you to use less stuff. Hopefully, you can use it to use 10% less stuff this year, and then we're off in the right direction. Right, thank you. That's, um, that's more than enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Penny, who has promised to talk in a far less dramatic tone of voice um, than me. Whilst Penny is just getting her screen up, um, I should just say how incredibly grateful the institution is to Elliot Wood for making this tool happen. Um, really big thanks to Penny, to Tom Howarth, Tom Hesselenberg, and Gary Elliott, along with everyone else at Elliot Wood who found the time to test, critique the tool, and get it to where it is today. Many of you who are listening have signed up to Structural Engineers Declare. That declaration talks about sharing and collaborating. And to me, creating and giving away a carbon tool is a pretty good example of meeting that declaration. So like I say, a big thank you to Elliot Wood, but also a big plea to everyone else to work out what you're going to do in order to push your own sharing and collaboration forward as we go through this journey together. Thank you for listening to me wrap it on, and I'll now hand over to Penny. Thank you very much, Will, and thank you to John for the introduction. All right, I'm going to get started uh, by giving you a bit of background about Elliot Wood and our journey to this point. So this is Elliot Wood, uh, albeit it's an old photo, and some of the faces have since changed. Unfortunately, it's not that easy to get a big group photo at the moment for obvious reasons. Um, I would describe us as a friendly bunch of structural and civil engineers with a very strong desire to do the right thing. We're always asking, how can we do it better? So Will has already very eloquently set out why we need to be minimising embodied carbon in our designs. But here are two facts that shocked me personally into acting. There are just two northern white rhinos left in the world, and they're both female. The impact we as humans have had on our ecosystems is sickening. We're literally destroying the natural world. And you're probably quite familiar with the second fact. The cement industry is a huge polluter. If it were a country, the cement industry would be the third largest emitter in the world. And we need to do something about it. 
Time is definitely ticking. And as structural engineers, we have to change the way that we work. If we're going to have the positive impact on society that we should be having. I, like Will, truly believe that it's our individual and collective responsibility to change how we use materials in the design of buildings and infrastructure. And we all have to act now. For the sake of these future generations, like Bobby, who Will talked about, and my own children, and for society, for society as a whole. So how did we get here this evening? At Elliot Woods, uh, we developed an embodied carbon tool, or what was the precursor to this tool, around five years ago. And we, we built it because we wanted to be able to quantify embodied carbon and help us to make better decisions and inform our clients more holistically about the choices we were making in our building designs. It's now an integral, integral part of our design process on all of our projects. The leaderboard, which is what you can see here, uh, followed the tool a few years later. It allows us to keep track of our best performing projects and those that are not performing quite so well in terms of carbon and have some friendly competition within the company, celebrate our successes, but most importantly, constantly share knowledge about ways we can further reduce embodied carbon in our designs and challenge each other to do better. So why are we giving this tool away then? It might seem a bit strange or a bit odd to some of you. It's taken us a long time to get to this point for the industry to catch up with relevant and consistent data and targets. But the recent How to Calculate Embodied Carbon Guide was a real turning point, along with the Letty uh, work that's been done by Letty as well to establish targets. And it seems like the right time to be sharing the tool now. Elliot Wood wants to make a positive impact and we really see that the provision of this free to use carbon tool is a key driver to help the profession to reduce the amount of embodied carbon being used in the construction industry. It is aimed at smaller practices who might not have the time or the knowledge to be able to create their own tool, but it's available to anyone who wants to download it. Because we, we really believe that the only way we will have the impact that we need to have that both Will and John have set out is for us engineers to collaborate. You know, competing with each other is not going to get us anywhere. So by making this tool open source, we're hoping that we will be able to work with you all to continue to develop how useful it is for everybody. So onto the tool itself now. You will probably all have seen this screenshot before when you booked onto this session. It features one of the scheme input pages, which we'll talk about in more detail later. But before we go on to talk in detail and do the live demonstration, it's worth recapping on the carbon life cycle first. So hopefully everyone's familiar with the carbon life cycle stages. So we start on the left hand side with the product stage, life cycle modules A1 to A3. This covers all the emissions associated with extracting raw materials and turning them into a manufactured product, in this case a construction product. The construction process itself is captured by A4 to A5, A4 being the transportation from the factory to the construction site, and A5 covers the carbon associated with construction itself. Life cycle stage B, modules B1 to B5, covers in use. These modules are not currently covered in the tool at present, largely because they're not really the main focus for structural engineers. Then end of life, is covered by life cycle modules C1 to C4, which deal with demolition or hopefully deconstruction and waste processing. Beyond the main life cycle stages is module D. This covers potential future benefits and burdens of the materials used in a structure. This is where the potential for reuse or recycling is captured. So to summarize, whole life carbon covers A to C. Upfront carbon, Sorry, upfront carbon is A1 to A5. B, we're not yet covered in the, in the tool. And then outside of the system boundary are the potential future benefits and burdens, module D, which are reported separately. So before launching into the live demonstration shortly, I'll talk you through the key features of the tool, starting with the scheme input page. This is where you enter the material specifications and the quantities to estimate the embodied carbon for a structural scheme. It's important that we just focus on that word estimate for a minute. 
as there are so many uncertainties in the underlying data that it's never going to be 100% precise. So I would urge you when you're using this tool not to be putting too much emphasis if one scheme is 2 or 3% better than another, because in reality, it more than likely will flip the other way. The tabs at the bottom, highlighted there, indicate all the sheets available to you. The intention is for users to work from the left-hand side across to the right. Orange tabs are information or basic project information. Blue tabs are the scheme input pages like this one. The green comparison sheet covers the main output from the tool and the gray tabs are for advanced users. You only need to go there if you want to. At the top, you can enter your scheme name and the tab for the sheet will automatically update down the bottom. You can then use the drop downs in this area highlighted red to specify the type of structural elements and specify the materials. So if we zoom in on that, you simply select from a drop down material, material type, material specification, select the type of structural element that you're dealing with. And these are all aligned to the RICS rules of measurement. Uh, the intention is when the uh, RICS revise their database that we will then be able to upload the data from the tool into their database. Then you specify your quantity in either mass or volume. So volume is preferred as it allows the inbuilt material densities to be used, so aids with consistency, but you can use mass or volume, it's up to you. The quantities themselves are calculated outside the tool, either by hand, with an analysis model, or if you have one, then a 3D BIM model, such as Revit. But I just want to really emphasize that you don't need a 3D BIM model to use this tool. You can quite easily do hand calculations. We do it all the time. For concrete, it's worth noting that you can then select from drop downs as to what type of reinforcement. So there are built in reinforcement densities that you can select from, and you can also change them. I'll show you later. So once you've entered that information, the quantities uh, in the spreadsheet are then used to automatically calculate the embodied carbon, and it splits it down by the life cycle stages that we've just, um, we've just mentioned. In the middle here, you have a box that summarizes the total embodied carbon. So we're reporting the upfront carbon, A1 to A5, and sequester carbon separately. Then we're reporting the whole life carbon, A to C, with module D reported separately. So these are total carbon, tons of embodied carbon. And then we are also reporting kilograms of carbon per square meter based on the area that the user has entered into the tool. The bottom half of the page provides summary charts and information for this particular scheme. These charts can be copied and pasted into reports or emails or presentations as you, as you like. The pie chart on the left indicates the proportion of embodied carbon by structural element type. This allows you to really hone in on areas of the structure that may need to be refined. The central section provides tangible metrics to describe what X tons of carbon means in real terms. This is really invaluable when speaking with clients. Comparison of the scheme embodied carbon against industry targets is also provided. Scores, Reba and Letty are all built into the tool for the different typologies that are available. And then finally, there's the scores label for this particular scheme. It's worth noting that you can enter up to six schemes, six different schemes into the tool. We've always found that to be ample. Hopefully you will too. So once the structural schemes are entered, there's a separate scheme comparison page where various charts are populated for you. These again can be used in reports or copied, pasted into emails, PowerPoints and so on. I'll run through these charts quite quickly one by one. So the first chart summarizes embodied carbon over life cycles A1 to A5 and A to C for each scheme. This gives the overall picture, comparing upfront carbon and life cycle carbon for each scheme. The right hand chart shows the proportion of embodied carbon by element type. So similar to the pie chart that we just spoke about, this allows you to consider carbon hotspot elements and identify ways to refine the design or see where one design is out of sync with another, and then you can interrogate why that difference exists. 
Next charts, on the left, the chart breaks down life cycle carbon by the various life cycle stages with sequestration and module D reported separately. So you can quite quickly see from this chart that um, schemes one and four have some timber in them because the sequestration is noted. The next chart on the right, on the right compares the total upfront carbon against industry targets for the structure only. So for this example, we're comparing the data with those targets relevant for residential buildings. On the comparisons page, we use the same metrics as are used on the scheme page, but we've set it up so that the difference between the most carbon intensive and the least carbon intensive schemes is used. So this essentially estimates the potential saving from progressing the least carbon intensive option in terms of flights, vegan diets, and average family cars. And then we have a table that uh, compares the scores ratings for the different schemes and then ranks them based on carbon intensity. Also included as part of the comparisons page is a simplified graph of the carbon in the atmosphere as a result of construction over time. So the chart typically jumps up at construction, module A, then it's horizontal during the life of the structure, module B, as module B is not currently covered by the tool then jumps up again when demolished or preferably deconstructed, and this is module C. So for timber schemes, we followed the forward-looking approach as we're considering carbon in the atmosphere on the y-axis. We start with zero again when we start construction. So modules A and C are represented as jumps upwards again, as you can see in the light blue line. So modules A and C are represented as jumps upwards again, but in between these, the line dips down to represent the sequestration from the replacement trees in your sustainably sourced forest. So for more information, please see Will Hawkins' paper in the January edition of the Structural Engineer. It's a good read. The scheme input pages and comparison charts are really the only part of the tool you actually need to be able to use to be able to get data out. However, for advanced users, we've provided a number of options for modification of the base data. So the majority of the data, all of the carbon factors, are taken from the institution's How to Calculate and Body Carbon Guide. And then all of this base data is included in a single table, a copy of which is accessible to the user. It allows you to amend data values directly into this table and highlights where changes have been made. So you can see here, that someone has changed the density from 2.4 to 2.6 for concrete. And so we flagged it as a kind of pinky purple color saying, are you sure that you want to do that? And then these other values have been changed and we've just flagged that they're different to the built-in data. If once you've made these changes, you think you've made a mistake or you want to go back and you want to reset the table, you can simply press the reset table button. This facility can be used to modify carbon factors for materials sourced from different countries, for instance. So we also offer the option to incorporate custom EPDs. So we recommend, as per the guide, that the standard values are used for early scheme stage design. But as the design evolves, and perhaps you're talking to a contractor about where you're going to source materials, you can start to add in specific EPDs and then you can run this through the tool and ensure that the design remains on track from a carbon perspective. To help with making these amendments to the base data and incorporating site-specific EPDs, we've included some calculators for the calculation of A4, so transportation. So for instance, if you know that you're building a house out of timber from a, from a local coppice, you can change the distance that the material is traveling to site. You can also have control over the distance to reuse, recycling or landfill, and we provide a calculator for C2. The one on the left, bottom left, is a calculation of the timber end of life scenarios. We've built in a couple of reference end of life scenarios for wood for goods and ricks, but you can also set up your own by changing the percentages of what's happening to that timber at the end of life. Finally, in the bottom right hand corner, as I mentioned earlier, you can have control over the reinforcement um, estimates that you're using for concrete elements. So you can go to this table, change the numbers, and again, you can reset 
that table if you want to go back to the defaults. It's worth just pointing out here that if you've entered all of your scheme information into your scheme pages, and then you realize you want to change from the reinforcement rates, you need to then go back to the scheme pages and select the new one that you've just added into this table. So it will tell you that there's an error on the scheme page, but it's just something to be aware of. So now for a live demonstration, you've already just had a little sneak peek of the tool when the, the presentation disappeared for a second. But here we are, it is just an Excel spreadsheet. As I said, the idea is that you work from left to right through the tabs down the bottom here. So the orange ones are where you would start, have a read of the welcome page when you first use it and the user guide. Maybe after that, you don't need to worry too much about those two tabs, but definitely worth a read the first time that you start to use the tool. The first tab where you actually have to enter any information is the project info tab. So if we look at the top here, there's a table at the top, which is just basic project information, a project number, a project name. You can pick a typology. There are only four, commercial, education, residential, and other. That's because these are only used to reference the, the relevant targets. And at the moment, uh, the Letty targets cover these, these different typologies. So that's why they're there. You can enter in the cell below what design stage this uh, calculation has been carried out. And that's just for user reference, really. The two fields which are flagged up as red when you open the tool are the two that really need to be entered because they directly impact on the calculations. The first one is your project value. This is used as part of the calculation for A5A. So I'm just going to enter 15 million as a project value, construction value, and then the gross internal floor area. So this tool is set up for buildings, but if it's not a building, say it's a bridge, you can use a functional area. Or if you're not looking at a whole building, then you can certainly just put in the relevant area for, say, a bay that you're looking at. Uh, so this number I'm just going to put in at 7,500. The next subtable below are a few assumptions. Now, these, these are numbers that are used throughout the tool or decisions that are used throughout the tool. So you can have control here over your average distance to landfill. You can select different reinforcement options, so UK or worldwide averages. The next two um, relates to excavation. So inbuilt into the tool, we have set it up such that if you specify a certain volume of foundations, in addition to calculating the embodied carbon from the uh, material used for those foundations, we're also allowing for removing that excavated material from site. So the default is 100% of that material gets removed from site, but you might want to change that. You may have designed it so that no, none of the excavated material gets removed from site and you're reusing, reusing it on site. So you can change that number. Equally, you would want control over the soil density dependent on what, what site conditions you have. Finally, there's the design life. So before we go into comparing some sort of real life schemes, what I wanted to really just point out to you and prove to you is that this tool can be used for any scale of project. So I'm aware that maybe some of the people um, viewing this, this webinar now are working primarily on say domestic projects. And so I just want to give a very basic um, illustration of a domestic project. So say you've got a rear extension of a house, the client wants to take out the rear elevation from ground to first floor and put in a new, we need to put in a new box frame or picture frame to make that happen. So normally you do that in steel. If I zoom in a bit so that you can see. So you would normally do that as a steel frame probably. So you can select steel as your material, structural sections as material type, UK open sections, structural elements would be frame. You just put in here steel frames, this can be whatever you want, it's for your own use really. I said that the preference was to use volume, but with steel obviously you'd normally do it in, in mass. So maybe you've got 700 kgs of kilograms of steel, and then it quickly spits out what your element and body carbon is for that. If you then wanted to say, well, actually today, I want to see what the effect would be if I did it in, say, concrete, then you can 
do the same thing, select your concrete mix. Put some text in there if you wish. Volume probably is easier for concrete, so maybe 1.8 cubic meters. It's then just flagging this cell as being red because you need to enter some reinforcement. So you have two options here. You can either select reinforcement from a predefined list with um, estimates in, in brackets there. So you might, for this instance, say general beam, and it will incorporate the reinforcement into the calculation for the carbon. Or if you have already done the design, you know what your reinforcement is, you can put your mass concrete in for that and enter a separate line with steel and reinforcement and so on. I won't go through the rest of it. Obviously, you can put as many options as you like in here. One thing to draw your attention to, this, the tool is set up as default to round all of the numbers to the nearest ton of carbon. So I just wanted to make you aware that if you are dealing with a domestic scale project, then you probably want to increase the number of decimal places that we are showing on the outputs. And that's really easy to do. All of these, all of these sheets in this, in this tool are password protected. We provide the password, it's carbon, not very, uh, not very difficult to remember. And you can go in, change how many decimal places you're showing, reprotect the uh, the sheet, and then just carry on in the safe in the knowledge that you're not going to cause any other other things to change in the sheet. Um, obviously, if in in this example, I've put the different options as a different line, a different row. Uh, so these charts below will not make much sense uh, in this instance. But you could have put each of those options on a different sheet, and then obviously you would you would be able to see the impact of those uh, output charts. Okay, so that was just something I wanted to point out. I have pre-populated uh, scheme sheets two to five with a real life example, um, a mix of concrete frames, steel frames, timber frames. So again, I've gone through and I've done exactly the same thing, selected materials. There is quite a lot of inbuilt error checking in this. So say for instance, I absentmindedly changed this to timber, but all of these material types and material specifications stayed with the concrete, it would flag it up in red. So, and it will tell you check material type and spec. So don't be scared by the, the sort of the red cells. It's just trying to help you where there's inconsistencies in the data. So for each of these schemes, we can see the charts that I've already talked about. Once you're happy with what you've entered for each of the schemes, you can go to the comparisons page and all of the charts are already pre-populated for you. You don't have to do anything on this page except select which schemes you want to show. So, for instance, I have pre-populated two to five with comparable scheme information. So I'm just going to change scheme two to scheme five to yes, update charts, and it updates all the charts and all of the tables, and you can then say, right, well, actually, scheme four, I don't like the look of that. I don't really want to talk about that or show that to my client. So I'll just turn that one off, update it again, and then you're good to go. You can copy and paste those charts, copy and paste the text, whatever you want into presentations or reports. So all very simple. Um, to the right-hand side are the two sort of advanced user tabs where you can go in and you can change numbers. So I can change this number to 0.2 or something, and it'll just flag up that it's changed. But I won't go through those again. I've, I've touched on those during the presentation. Right, so back to the presentation. I thought it would be useful to outline a few ways in which we've used the carbon tool over the past few years, and hopefully encourage you to follow suit when presenting your structural designs in future. So we mostly use the tool to compare structural scheme options at, at concept stage, like Will suggested. Images such as these are useful for reports and also to explain our sort of big picture thinking and help make decisions between different frame options, different material options, different grids, anything like that. Doesn't, obviously, it doesn't have to be a BIM image. If you don't have BIM models, it could be a sketch. But I think, you know, picture tells a thousand words. We've also used the output from the carbon tool for um, grid comparisons and to quantify the impact of longer spans on carbon. There's an awful lot of talk still around maximizing flexibility um, and having large spans. Clients are often asking for flexibility in large spans, but these often come at a carbon cost. 
So for instance, in this example, increasing the longitudinal grid from six meters to nine meters uh, results in a 10% increase in carbon, whilst increasing it to 12 meters is a 40% increase. So there's quite a significant carbon cost there. We've used the tool to quantify the carbon involved in constructing an extension on an existing building and associated internal modifications. So the tool is equally applicable to refurbs as it is to new builds. Sometimes we've used it to compare a new build option um, versus an extension of an existing building, like this example here. So for extension on the reef and the internal alterations, we've got sort of six and a half thousand tons of, of carbon versus a new build option of maybe nine and a half tons of nine and a half thousand tons. So you could even use the tool to estimate the embodied carbon within an existing structure, although there's not normally a need to do this. And finally, we used this approach on a recent project and it was really, really helpful. And I'm going to do it a lot more in future. So we've, we've called this the waterfall diagram. And we started with a base structural scheme here and then brainstormed a range of different ideas to try and reduce the embodied carbon in the proposed structure. We were able to make some initial tweaks to the grid and the existing basement areas uh, to reduce the embodied carbon from the initial scheme down to a baseline planning scheme here. We then estimated the impact of all of our other ideas using the tool, and we've shown them graphically on this chart to clearly demonstrate that lots of incremental changes add up to a big impact, allowing us to set a much more ambitious developed design target um, with additional opportunities that we've identified to potentially improve on this further if at all possible. So it's really not just about one big idea uh, lots of small ideas can add up to, to a big idea overall. So that's it from me for now, and I'll hand over to Will to finish off. Thank you, Penny. Um, yeah, so just, um, I guess, you know, a couple of quick slides here to wrap up. Um, we've, we've talked about why this is important tonight. Um, you know now how much impact you have, and really now it's over to you to, to take that knowledge and, um, you know, download the tool and, and go ahead and apply this to, to every project that you can. So yeah, two final reminders. So number one reminder, um, don't forget whatever you do, this is not about car carbon calculations, this is about carbon reduction. Don't forget that you need to do these numbers early on. You need to then take them away and do something with them afterwards, otherwise it's all kind of pointless. And, and don't forget that you know we have these conversations in this much bigger picture world that we live in. Um, but of course, these are important conversations to have and your reduction of carbon is impactful. And if you haven't discovered it already, that's the link for the tool. Um, you can go and download it now. Please do stick around for our Q&A. Um, we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. I think uh, John's about to come back on just to wrap up before we do and then we'll, we'll see how many we get through. But yeah, do download the tool. Um, like Penny said, you can unlock it. The password is carbon because we're not that inventive. Um, and, you know, play with it, do things with it, try and incorporate it into your current digital workflows, get it incorporated into BIM or Rhino or whatever you want to do with it, um, and then share it with everyone else that you can. Um, we'd love to hear back from you as to what, what you use it for. So there's, there, are, there are lots and lots of questions. We will try and get through as many as we can. Um, Penny, I think the first one maybe is, is one for you, and it's about applicability of the tool internationally. A few people have been asking, can I use this outside of the UK? So can we use the tool around the world? Short answer is yes, for definite. Um, yeah, the base data is all based on the structural, um, the Institution of Structural Engineers guide. There is some UK centric data in there, but there's enough flexibility for users to be able to change things themselves, which is what I was trying to trying to demonstrate with those uh, custom EPDs and the ability to modify the base data. So yes, for sure. Yeah, excellent. And, and linked to that, there's a few questions on the data itself. So Frank has asked, where did the background data for the tool come from? Is the data dynamic and update, updated? Duncan has asked, are the EPD values editable? And there's a few questions around natural materials. Are there natural material data in the tool? So Will, do you want to comment on the data sources and how that will be up sure. 
Yeah, so um, they're, they're not live. They don't auto-update. We made that decision quite deliberately um, because we want you to know if they've been updated. We don't just want to spring it on you in the background. Um, if we update the guide, the House Calculating Body Carbon Guide, we will also update the tool. That's the working plan. Um, and, of course, we, we know that things are changing, so we're anticipating that some new numbers will have to come out at some point in the future. You can edit the EPDs, as Penny showed, so you can change the numbers yourself if you think you have better data that you want to use on your projects. Um, and if you, you know, if you want to include natural materials such as thatch or rammed earth or earth blocks or anything brilliant like that, please just add them in as custom materials. Um, I guess the, the short answer to the question on do you have natural materials is yes, we have timber in there, um, but we don't really have much else beyond that at, at this point in time. Fantastic, thanks. And then, Penny, perhaps this is one for you about using the tool for beyond buildings. So we have a question from Philip. Is there an aspiration to extend the tool to other infrastructure structures such as bridges and tunnels? Is that something that will happen, do you think? I don't I don't see that there's any real difference. I don't see that a different tool is needed, to be honest, um, because the only thing that is really building specific was the gross internal floor area, which is one of the inputs on the project info page. But you can set that area to whatever you want it to be. So if that's a bridge functional area or some sort of road area or something, um, you can set it like that and it will still work. Uh, the Letty and the Reba targets won't be applicable, but I mean, you can arm protect the sheet and delete those, those series from the charts and they won't appear. Um, so, yeah, I don't see there's any real issue. All it is, all it requires is quantities and material specs. So as long as you've got those, you can use it to get embodied carbon values. Out. I guess the only other thing that might change would be the construction emissions, so A5A. Um, which is for a building is based on this number that we got from the RICS guide that says that for every, I can't remember what the ratio is, but 1,400 kilograms cost you, no, I'm going to get it wrong. There's a ratio linking building cost to kilograms of carbon emitted on site, which we know is very rough and not that useful. If you're building a bridge, I guess that's probably quite likely to be different. Um, but until somebody has better data for that anyway it's all still a bit of sort of guesswork at this point in time but but again same as what penny said you can always unlock the tool and you know chuck these extra bits in if you wanted to nothing stop anyone from doing that great thanks and we have a question here from matthew saying does the calculator factor in waste which is a byproduct of the manufacturing process e.g for steel so five percent waste off cut so penny perhaps you can comment on that one yes um, it, they're all in there. So all of the base data, we've got the waste rates as per the guide, and you have control over those waste rates as well. You can change those if you want to. So if you've got a specific data from a particular manufacturer, then yeah, absolutely no problem in, in changing them, but they are all in there. Great. And I suspect it will be a similar answer. We've got a, quite a few questions around concrete mixes. So Ganga and Pedro have been asking about, can we add different concrete mixes? So for example, GGBS, PFA, et cetera. I, Penny, you can answer that one. Yeah, as long as you've got the EPD data, you can put them in as custom EPDs. There are quite a few in there, but obviously we didn't want to just have, you know, like a hundred rows just of concrete uh, mixes. So yeah, if you've got specific ones, then add them yourself, definitely. Excellent. I will tell you, if it's all right, I'll take the opportunity just to point out that we, we do advise that if you're at the early stage of design, you don't get too hung up on what your concrete mix could be. Um, we always suggest that you take sort of regional averages. So if you know what the average amount of cement replacement is in the area that you're building your building, start with that. If we all do that, then on average, we'll all make the right decisions. Um, but of course, update it later on if, you're, uh, if your final mix that comes to site has 75% GGBS in, then of course you could um, you could always chuck that in. There's also I think there's also a link in the tool to the Bath ICE database directly. So you can you can click that link and that'll take you to the relevant pages so you can grab all of that concrete information a bit more a bit more quickly if you want to yeah fantastic um i just bring together two questions one from frank and one from michael so michael has asked when would you recommend the tool is used and he suggested perhaps reverse stage 012 and frank has said who in the design process is responsible and who is qualified to do this calculation 
So Penny, perhaps that's one for you. How, how have you dealt with that? Who's qualified to do a carbon calculation? I think we're more than qualified to do it. Um, at the end of the day, we're taking, we are scheming structural schemes. We're putting schemes together for a building or piece of infrastructure. And based on what goes into that, all we're doing is calculating quantities and then applying the materials, the specifications for the materials that we're proposing to use. So we've never had any issue with that. Um, I taught myself five years ago. And uh, yeah, there's not been an issue really. Well, the first question, can you just repeat the first question? So we had who is responsible and at what stage? Of no, the what stage yeah. So um, as soon as you've got a scheme, basically, I would definitely recommend that you do it at the earliest possible opportunity, because the only way that we're going to make the big changes that we need to do is by changing the scheme and the approach early on. If this isn't about getting to like Reba stage four, and then tweaking our concrete mix to make things better. Because by making it better on your project, you're just making it worse on someone else's project. So you're not actually having any global impact. And it's the global impact that we need to have. So it's about coming up with better, um, more efficient, more clever schemes, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. The earlier, the better. Um, so we have a couple of questions about site emissions. So Harry. Kishner has asked, does it all allow, include an allowance for transport to site and carbon sequestration? And there was another question about how do, we, how do we calculate carbon emissions on site? So, Will, do you want to comment on the A5A? Sure, yeah. So um, carbon emissions on site is you know, very much in its infancy of understanding at the moment. There's not much site data out there. Um, at the moment, the, the tool follows the guide and, and the guide follows the RICS guide. Um, so there's a ratio between construction costs and size emissions that, that we follow, which will add somewhere in the realms of 5% or so to your total emissions. But it, it is included and it does do that automatically. Um, I think you also mentioned transport and sequestration. They are also both included automatically within the tool. Um, transport is based on how far it's come and by what method of transport. There are some defaults in there, but there's also, as Penny showed on the custom data page, you can edit how far things have come and by what mode of transport. So if you know that you're getting timber from, you know, the forest down the road from you instead of from, you know, the, the eastern end of Germany, which is kind of what we've assumed, um, then you can always you can always reduce that if you want to. Great, thanks. Um, and then there's a question here about the sort of scope of the spreadsheet. So Hytham has asked, why not cover module B4 as it should be easy to integrate? So Penny, was any particular reason but not including B4? I think, well, it's two, twofold, really. Uh, the first being that we're really just trying to get people to do these embodied carbon calculations and start doing them. That, that's the main push for this. And where we have the biggest influence as structural engineers, I would argue, is, is in Module A um, in terms of what we're actually specifying and how much we're specifying of it. Um, module B4 is going to be quite small, comparatively speaking. And I believe at the time, well, certainly when we developed the tool as Elliot Woods, there wasn't the data available to do it. Um, it's probably something that will potentially be incorporated in future versions. But at the moment, it's just quite clean looking at A and C. So. Yeah, fantastic. Um, this is a slightly bigger picture one, which I think perhaps is one for you, Will. Um, it's from another Will, um, who's asked, are there any plans to collect or publish results of different types of projects from across industry as standards so we can track progress of our collective embodied decarbonisation? So, uh, so, so in short, yes. Um, the iStruck T are not planning to collect it ourselves. Um, what we're asking people to do instead is when, as soon as you've sort of got to the point in your project where you think your calculations are done, submit them to the RICS database it doesn't make sense for the iStruct T to just collect the structural data. Um, it makes far more sense for us all to pull all of our data together into one place. The RICS database um, has, has been up and running for a while now. It's going to go through a bit of a refresh at some point at the end of this year or beginning of next year, so it'll be more usable and more easy, but that's the place we want you to go and put your data. But absolutely, yes, we need people to submit their project results at the end of their project so that we can start to get a whole lot better at this benchmarking. At the moment, all of our benchmarking is based on a few hundred projects and we build 
you know, tens of thousands of buildings per year in this country alone. So there's huge scope for this. No, absolutely. Making more submissions to the RICS database. And as you said, it is due to be updated. We're working hard on that at the moment. It's really important as part of this learning as we go down the slope from our graphs earlier on. Um, Penny, another one for you, perhaps, um, about the time it takes to do these assessments. So Matthew has asked, how long does it normally take to assess each scheme? Which I guess is a question about hours worked. So how long does your team normally take to run this? Generally, not very long. I suppose it depends. It depends on how you're calculating the quantities. Actually running it through the tool once you've got the quantities and you know what your materials are is very, very quick. I mean, I would say you can do it in a matter of 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, the time is in designing the schemes, which is what you have to do anyway. So there's no real time there. And then turning your structural scheme into something that can be quantified. So we have some calculating helpful sort of calculators that we use internally when we're doing it by hand. If you've done any sort of analysis model, then you can get rough quantities out of that analysis model. You don't have to be too precise about it. This, this is the point we're trying to get across is that there's so many um, assumptions in the underlying data that we just need ballpark quantities for a very initial scheme comparison. Um, so you can get them from hand calcs, from 3D analysis model or a model, a Revit model, or BIM model, if you've got it later down the line. Great. Um, and then there's a few questions about temporary works, which perhaps I'll just read one of them from David, who has said, how does the tool take into account any temporary works required? Does the permanent work designer need to estimate this as opposed to, say, the contractor's temporary works designer? So, um, Will, perhaps you can comment on how we incorporate temporary works into the tool. Yeah, sure. Um, so you you should include temporary works if you think they're going to be significant. Um, you can include them in the same way that you would include permanent works. They are, after all, just construction materials. You probably have to think a bit differently about them. Um, if there's a chance that they were created for other projects, then you might not assume that there was any upfront A1 to 3 emissions with them, but there would still have been transport emissions. Um, they'd still be bought to sites. Their lifespan would be different. They're then going to be removed from site. So it does take a bit of thought to get it in there. Um, but fundamentally, you're just probably going to end up creating a new EPD that's a sort of custom thing for whatever temporary works you've got and putting them in. And I think that particularly if you're working on a project where you know there's going to be a lot of it uh, because it's complex geometry or maybe it's something which is just going to require an awful lot of propping until the point where the concrete is cured and it's ready to be depropped, then it's always worth thinking about this. Otherwise, we're going to sort of undo some of our good work by designing things that are not only difficult to build, but actually more carbon intensive than we thought they were going to be. So mm. yeah, do think about it and do put it in there if you can. Particularly if one scheme has much, you know, much more temporary works yes. than another scheme, because otherwise you're introducing bias when you're comparing the two. Yeah, and I think that's quite a good point in general, Penny, isn't it? Is that like, you know, if you've got two schemes that you're if you're doing some optioneering, um, if there are critical differences between those, which is not necessarily to do with the permanent structural material itself you do want to think about including that. So an obvious one is if you're working with, say, a timber scheme and a concrete scheme, that timber scheme might need protection from fire, which might include other layers that the concrete scheme doesn't necessarily need to have. So asking yourself what the difference is between things and just making sure that you're comparing it all on an even footing, whether that's temporary, permanent, non-structural, structural, whatever it is, um, that's really important to help you make a good decision. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, I could go back to two more um, questions about how we might get people to buy into this tool. So Luke has asked, do you add, add the time to calculate body carbon to your tender price slash program and how do you get your clients to buy in? So Penny, that's one for you. That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, I have to say, speaking completely honestly, it, it's something that we've, we've ended up doing um, without charging, I would say, specifically for it. But as a result, because we're doing these calculations and we're thinking in this way, we're getting approached by clients because they want to talk about carbon. And so whilst we might not be recouping our costs on every single project from spending that little bit of extra time looking at this, it is probably definitely paying dividends in terms of the clients who are then seeing us as thinking about these things and wanting to make a difference to the climate emergency and therefore getting other projects through that route. Yeah. If anyone works out how to monetize it, 
then let me know. <laughs> <laughs> and I think related to that, Penny, Paul, Paul has asked or has said that the majority of his projects are small and then um, he, getting involved later on, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, getting involved later on in the stage where architects have already designed things. Do you have any advice on how the spreadsheets could be used to be able to influence a change in construction format for a small project? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, we created the tool kind of largely because we know a lot of the bigger firms have tools like this already. And there's also the small firms who are sort of saying, ah, when, when am I going to get started out of time? I've got to fix the photocopier. I've got to do, you know, all of this extra stuff that you have to do if you just work on lots of small jobs. This is why we're really keen to create this. Um, I think that even if you're coming to a project late, even if you feel like all the decisions have already been made without you, um, I think you'd be surprised how often people are receptive to you saying, okay, I've, I've, I've chucked in the quantities based on your drawings, but I'd also realise that if you did X, Y, and Z, the quantities would look a bit more like this. Are you aware that that's, I don't know, 100 tonnes of carbon? And are you aware that's the equivalent to going vegan for the next five years or 50 years or whatever it is? Um, I'm never being vegan at maths. So, you know, have a go anyway is what I'd say. And I think it's, you know, we, we see this at all scales of firm, people coming back to us saying, actually, you know what, I went back to the clients and suggested doing something different. And they actually did say yes. Um, it's, all, it's always worth a shot. And hopefully this tool just makes that process easier for you to try and do. And hopefully it makes it quick enough that you can have a go at it in between doing all the other millions of things that you're going to do this week. Yeah, and the more conversations that we're having, the more kind of mainstream it will become as well. And there's quite a few questions about facade. So maybe I'll just take one from Lynette. So would you, she's asked, would you recommend adding facade components into the calculation, noting that these are often prefabricated elements? So what, what are your comments on facades, Penny? Again, I would come back to what we were saying before. You've just got to be careful that when you're comparing schemes, that you're comparing them on a level playing field. So if one scheme has one type of facade that's you know more integrated into the into the structure and therefore is being counted accounted for and the other the other scheme doesn't then you should I would say be including it in that second scheme. I think in terms of every last component it's going to be difficult at an early stage to be able to account for every single last component in that facade. But yeah certainly I would say that an allowance should be made. Yeah, which is linking to a, a question here from Matthew, which is that idea that we need to do carbon assessments for more than just a structure. So do we have plans or do you have plans, sorry, to link to you know, MEP or architectural carbon counts so that we're not just considering structure in isolation? Yeah, I mean, there are various tools already available. Um, one click LCA is one that comes off of my head, which does the whole whole life cycle carbon. And um, with the new London plan, it's becoming a requirement of planning in London. So that is something that we would feed into as engineers. I don't think as Elliot Woods, we've got any plans to try and replicate those tools. We're very much focused on, on the structure and giving someone something on their desktop computer that they can just you know, plug some numbers in and get a, get a rough idea. Uh, this tool is not sort of accredited by BRIAM or any of those accreditations. So if the client was going for that, then they would need to run it through that whole life cycle carbon tool at some point. But it was probably the, the point at which they do that, you probably decided what your scheme is going to be. So this is generally before that stage where we're trying to say, you know, think about this and advise your client on possible different ways of doing it so that when you actually get to the point of doing your whole life cycle carbon, it, it's better than it would have been had you not done this thinking early on. Yeah, I think um, yeah, this is like the 80-20 rule thing, right? 80% of the impact for 20% of the effort. The idea of this tool and the reason why it's structures only and will probably remain structures only is that we know that in a typical building, like two thirds of the embodied carbon is the structure. And out of the rest of that, you know, you then got a bit of that's the facades, a bit of it's the finishes, a bit of it's the MEP. It all gets quite bitty. Within that structure, if you've only got two materials fundamentally that you're using on any given project, you kind of want to, if you're going to make the biggest impact for the least amount of thinking time, so right up at the scheme stage, you want to be work out where you're going to put those materials and what you're going to do about them. And I think Penny's spot on. By the time you get to the point where you're doing whole building, whole life, life cycle analysis, 
you've got a lot of things sort of locked in place by that point. You know, when you're submitting for planning, you've made lots of decisions. The idea of this tool is that early on, you can have a really quick go. You can work out, well, actually, roughly, we want to do this or not this. Or, I don't know, in this scheme, actually, it's all about the basement. It's not even about the superstructure on the roof. All my car was in the basement. What am I going to do about that? And help you make those good decisions so that by the time we get to the point where you're doing whole building, whole life cycle, you've already locked in a pretty efficient structure in the first place. Yeah, and, and related to that issue of other tools, and Mark has asked, are the outputs compatible with the models generated by one click? So is there an interface between one click and the spreadsheet, or does that not exist yet, Penny? We haven't designed any sort of interface, but at the end of the day, it just comes down to quantities. Um, I have used one click NCR, LCA a few times, and um, I found that some of the EPD information is quite quite difficult to get to. So. Yeah, it's not aligned as such, but there's no reason why you can't put the quantities that you're using in our tool and plug them through another piece of software. Great. And a few, and we probably wrap up relatively soon, but there are a few questions around what's coming in the future. So some people just asking what, what's next for Elliot Wood, but also Mike has asked, is there any uncertainty quoted in the calculator? And if not, is that an area of future development? So I don't know if you've got any thoughts on the uncertainty behind the various parts of the assessment, Penny? We haven't quantified it. I, I suppose I've tried to make the point through this presentation that they, they are estimates and there is a lot of uncertainty in the underlying data. Um, and obviously there will be some uncertainty in some of the quantities that we're putting in. Um, we can try and quantify it. I think, Will, you had some thoughts about. Yeah, I've, I, I'm a big fan of bounding things. Um, you know, I did a lot of sort of dynamic stuff about when I was a practicing engineer, you end up bounding everything, right? Everything's lower bound and upper bound, and then you've got to use some judgment to work out where in the middle of that you're going to um, land. You can use this tool in the same way, right? It's got six schemes, but they could be three schemes each for lower bound and upper bound. And for each of those, you could say, well, if the material was likely to be this, was it like if it was likely to be this, what would it look like? And you can do that relatively quickly because, of course, you can then just copy the quantities from one tab straight into the next. So I'd encourage people, particularly when you know you're working with a material that does have a wide range of possible carbon factors, the obvious example being any kind of metal, steel, um, that you maybe do grab your quantities after you've done your first pass, chuck it into a second sort of scheme tab and just play with those specs and see where it could fall. Because if that can help you determine that actually my option A is within this range and option B is within this range, but is usually lower, then you've got a lot more sort of certainty that you're making the right choice if they just completely overlap then you know you might want to sort of start thinking about other drivers as well as carbon to help you make that decision or work out what needs to change in the brief say to get one of those down further than the other so yeah lots of things you can do not not fully encompass yeah i'd love to just say that yes you click a button and all of a sudden all of these lines become big blurs of the right width but maybe we'll maybe we'll sort that out later on mm -hmm. at some point don't mm -hmm. hold me to that <laughs> <laughs> and then in terms of using the tool, Penny, I think it's probably one for you. There's a few questions about um, the license, I suppose, copyright. So the tool is free, freely available. Anybody can use it. You've given the password. There's no limits on its use. Is that right? Essentially, in a nutshell, yes. There is a statement in there, as you will see on one of the introductory sheets that sets out like why it would have done this. Uh, there is a uh, copyright in terms of we retain a copyright for all the, the work that's gone into it to produce this actual tool in its current state. But um, we're very we're very keen for for companies to be able to use this tool and put it into their reports, put it into their presentations, and very conscious that they're not going to want Elliot Wood's logo all over it. So we purposely haven't put our logo all over it. And so, yeah, therefore, basically, you're free to download it, use it as you wish. And if you want to play around with it, improve it, tweak it. If you come up with anything really good, then all I would ask is that you just let us know, really, so that we can you know, help to improve it overall for everybody, really. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. I think although we still have many tens of questions on the list, we will bring it to a close there. And I'll just say, uh, Will, that a few people have noticed the very sad looking polar bear in the background of your video. So <laughs> I'm not sure if that was a hint about the effect of rising temperatures or not. 